Now let's start pulling this together. You know the first law of thermodynamics. You can't lose heat or gained. Okay, heat of the universe is constant. Okay, so here we go. So let's look at the second law of thermodynamics. This is why a lot of people don't not understand the second law of thermodynamics. Because the second law of thermodynamics relates to entropy. And entropy is kind of a hard thing to get your head around. Okay, but you're in this class, so you can now learn about the second law of thermodynamics. I think it's three big laws of thermodynamics. I mean, it's the, as they say, if, if you have something that violates one of the three laws of thermodynamics, I can give you no hope. There is nothing for your science but abject humiliation. It, that's a pretty close paraphrase of a guy from the early 1900s. So these things are really, really, really serious. These are the big ones. These are the big ones. Okay, so let's talk about the second law of thermodynamics, and let's get you into that. Here's what we do. Now, this is pretty obvious so far. Delta S for the universe is equal to delta S for the system plus delta S for the surroundings. Duh. Okay, you know that. But here's what defines something spontaneous. If delta S for the universe is greater than zero, then it's spontaneous. In other words, Mother Nature is always trying to get here. Yep. And that's sad in a way. Because what does this mean? Mother Nature is trying to spontaneous things. What delta S is greater than universe. So let's use our words that describe this. Things become more chaotic, more random. Energy becomes less usable. Ugh. That's what all that means. So that's, uh, that's that ashes to ashes and dust to dust thing, right? It's going to take our structured body and take it back to individual molecules. Why? Because Mother Nature is spontaneous. And everything she does, she tries to make changes that increase entropy. Okay, can we have other types? You betcha. We can have non-spontaneous. Okay, and this is non-spontaneous. Water doesn't flow uphill, but can you get water to flow uphill? Yep. You just got to do a bunch of work and use pumps and things to make it happen or get a bucket and walk it up the hill. So you got to put energy. So this is why we're always having to put effort in to make things good. Right? Clean your room or anything else. It's hard to make things good. Why? Well, because you're trying to make entropy negative. And when you do negative, that's non-spontaneous. And when it's non-spontaneous, you got to work. Okay? So see? Second law is just really about why your room gets messy or not. Okay. And then now for the, for, for the reversible thing. So here's what this means. So when we talked about it being reversible, when we talked about it being on that line, delta S for the universe is zero. And this is why, now you know, why in chemistry we talk about, is it reversible, is it reversible? Because now we have a zero, a delta S equals zero that we can peg to it. Okay. So with that, let's look at this. Right. This is a key point not to get lost here. This is a key point. Okay, at least for understanding it. Okay, so if delta S, if surroundings are vast, and it is, for most chemists, the surroundings are vast. And I have, for example, the, the surroundings, the entire earth is pretty vast compared to your campfire. Your campfire is your system. You've got chemical reaction going in a small location. Well, guess what? That heat and the randomness can go out, and that affects... That can basically go anywhere on planet Earth, those molecules and their freedom. So, if the surroundings are vast, then what we can, for our surroundings, then we can assume that delta, that Q for the surroundings is essentially reversible. In other words, you're not going to, the, the, the changes in your surroundings are going to be so slight, it's going to be smooth. You're not going to get a big step change. You offer your campfire, the part right around the campfire is going to be big changes. Oh man, you get close, a little bit closer, and it gets really warm. The molecules are really moving fast. And then, so you could just step change. But, it, but looked at it from the perspective of a satellite, it's just a smooth change. Okay, so here's what this means. Substitute into here. Delta S for the universe is equal to the systems plus the surroundings. But we can rewrite that delta S for you, the inverse, equal to the system, plus Q surroundings, delta T. 
okay, where this is reversible. So here's the deal. Hold that thought and let's now look at Okay, it didn't freeze. Okay, let's now pull this together and look at why water freezes at minus 10 and does it. Okay, so let's look at our simple process. Water is a solid and it goes to water at liquid. Is it spontaneous? Okay, well normally we say, and I've always said this earlier, well no, you gotta add heat. Okay. <laughs> Why did I say that? Because I was assuming, and you didn't know better to challenge me on it. Somebody could have said, that ain't true. You don't need to add heat to it. If you're at, a, if you're at room temperature, if you're, at, a, if you're at, a, at room temperature, you don't need to add heat to get the solid to go to a liquid. It happens without adding heat. What do you mean? It? What do you mean you need to add heat? Okay. So nobody challenged me on it, but you could have. And that would have been unfortunate because I, I couldn't tell you why without explaining all of this. On the other hand, but this is true if it's what? At zero degrees. Yes? Okay. So it was always kind of sort of assumed, it was always kind of sort of assumed that you were below the freezing point and then you had to add the liquid to it. You had to add the heat to it because it was not spontaneous. Okay. So I cheated a little bit. Or, I, or, or you assume something with my the way the question was worded and I'll let you go with that assumption. Okay, so now we're going to see what I would have had to say if somebody had said, no, 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 that's not, that's not true. You don't always have to add heat. And then somebody else would say, well, why don't you always have to add heat? That's funny, yeah. You see, if ice is like just out, you get ice out of the, you get water out of your freezer and you got to add heat to make it go liquid. But hey, if you take water at 10 degrees C, you don't have to add any heat to get it to go to water. It is water. So what's the deal with that? All right, we're gonna look at that. So here we go. The first thing we know about this process is delta S is equal to 22.1 kilojoules per, per increase in degree Kelvin. That is our change. That's how much entropy is being gained when we do this. Okay, as an aside, because this bugged me. Textbooks just start you out here and they say, see, this is this is what it is for the system. And I'm like, wait a minute, how, I, I'm calling that. How do I know it's 22.1? 20, what does that even mean? How did you get that? How did you? So they get me to work this problem and then they give me this assumption. I'm like, well, I, I, I can't get by this assumption. So I looked it up for you. So here's how we got there. And you know this. Now we're going to do something very, very simple. We talked about the amount of heat it takes, right? Delta heat fusion. What's that? The amount of heat that you've got to remove to freeze water. So you're familiar with this term. You should be. You've heard it before when we talked about phase changes. So let's look at the temperature. So delta S at zero degrees where this happens. So delta S, I have a delta S fusion. And if I'm at zero degrees, I know that's 273. So it's just merely the delta H of fusion, which is 6010 joules. We can look that up. You could measure that easy enough. Hey, freeze water and see how many joules was lost. See how many joules got sucked out. And then divide it by the temperature and you get the 22.1. So this is how much your system is at equilibrium conditions. Okay, that makes it. So I just want you to see where, the, where this 22.1 came from. Here's why that's important. Because that's for your system. Okay, so now we know the system. Boom. Okay, so now, how about our surroundings? Well, we just said for our surroundings, we're going to use a different equation. We're going to use, we're going to use this equation for the surroundings. Yes, because of, because of our assumptions here. Okay. So let's now look down at that. Let's now look down. Okay, so here we go. So what is so this was delta S for our system in going from here to here. Well, how about our surroundings in going from here to here? What number is that? Okay. So if we look at this and do the measurement, we get we get how much heat? Minus 6.00 times 10 to the third joules. So we're just going to measure the heat change across here. Okay. 
and it was minus 6.0 e to the third. So what's that, 6,000? Yeah, that's 6,000 joules at, now we're at minus 10 here, yes? At 263.15. So I add that to 22.1 and I get minus 0 0.7. This is my delta S for my entire change. This is how much the universe, entropy in the universe changed. Minus 0.7 joules degree Kelvin. What this means is when I did this at minus 10, oh my gosh, the entropy of the universe actually shrunk. The whole universe, even just everything here, everything in the whole globe. I shrunk it because I froze some ice. I mean, yeah, because what? At minus 10. Okay. It shrunk. Well, what's that mean? It means it's non-spontaneous. That, that didn't happen at minus 10. That's a non-favorable change. Why? Because for it to be spontaneous, what? Delta S has got to equal positive, and here it's negative. That's not a spontaneous change. Okay. There we go. So what you actually do is you freeze things. And when you freeze it, they become more structured. And when they become more structured, delta S in the universe goes down. So here's the punchline. Here's what you really see. Hey, I worked this out and delta S is negative. And you know what that means. That means it's non-spontaneous. That means it's more structured. At what? At minus 10. Okay. Now let's look at your water, my dears. Now at positive 10. So I've got water at positive 10. And I want to look at the change. Okay, so I still have the same system. I've still got the same amount of heat that it's going to take to do this, delta S. But now what's my temperature? 283 instead of 263. 273 is, is 0 degrees, so positive 10 degrees is what? 283 Kelvin. And now when I do this math, I get a negative number here. When I subtract that from 22.1, oh my gosh, I get positive. 0 0.9 so that's what that's right now it's positive you know it's spontaneous <coughs> you know it's positive delta s is greater than zero so what does that mean it's going to happen so this will happen at 10 degrees this is what we've got so at 10 degrees if you've got ice this is going to happen you give me a cube of ice and you put it at at, at 10 degrees that's going to happen. Why? It's going to melt. Why? Because that's a favorable transition. Okay. Hopefully that helps. Understand in excruciating detail why, how ice works. Yes, at a certain temperature. But more than that, it's really, this, is, this teaches a whole bunch of things. It also teaches you how to do delta S calculations. Okay, so this is how you quantify those things. One, two. You learn about the sign of delta S as well. You learn about spontaneous and non-spontaneous, okay? So, as far as quantitative and qualitative type of questions, yes, these are qualitative. Hey, it goes up, it's more spontaneous, so therefore it's going to happen, okay? And these, these are quantitative. You can also tell me by how much it goes up. 0.09 joules degree Kelvin, okay? You can kind of skip this one a little bit. All this does is, if you want to walk through this, so uh, basically what I did was I got kind of bogged down on this. The textbook just kind of throw these two at you. And then I had to find out, of course, about where that came from. And then that got me into looking more. And then I found somebody who had a table, physicsforums.com. Okay. Uh, and they basically had done this same thing, and they just laid out all of these answers, and you can kind of see how they change, okay? And we're going to talk about delta G later, so that could have even come in here. But what we just talked about was, and I like this. This is real structured. Hey, if you got this temperature, you got this degree Kelvin, we know what delta H for our system is. If we know what delta H is, then we can calculate what delta S is. If we know delta S for our system, we can also calculate delta S for our surroundings. And delta S equals system uh, uh, plus surroundings. And so you add this and this, and you get this number. And you can see that that's uh, non-spontaneous at equilibrium and spontaneous. Yep, 
So that's a beautiful thing right there. As we go into Delta G, you could go ahead and carry this all the way over to Delta G, which is another punch line, and you would also see Delta G tells you the same thing, that it's not spontaneous melting at minus 10, but it is spontaneous at 10. Okay, so that's just kind of a summary page. The third law, and this is the last one, law of thermodynamics. Actually, there is a zero with law of thermodynamics. Probably didn't know that. They did one, two, three, and they came up with another one. And it's actually called the zero with law. So anyway, you can look that one up. Okay, the third law of thermodynamics doesn't need a whole lot of hoopla because here it is. It's normally worded this way. A perfect crystal at zero degrees Kelvin constitutes a single microstate. Okay, there's the big boy definition. Okay, so how I had described zero degrees Kelvin is that you have no... VRT. You have no vibrations, you have no rotations, you have no translations. If you have absolutely no movement, you can have no temperature. All right, that's kind of the, that's a way to rationalize it. Okay, so here's what it really says. If you have a perfect crystal at zero degrees Kelvin, it's true there, nothing is absolutely moving. So how many microstates do you have? In other words, if you've got one solid particle that's perfect, how many particles you got? One. What's one squared? One. You got one microstate. That's all you can have. If you've got one microstate, the Boltzmann constant times the log of one gives you zero. So there is mathematically how you can look at the entropy, not just rationalize, but you can look at the entropy on a statistical basis. So it's kind of weird. You can look at the, you can look at entropy in terms of a heat basis, or you can look at it on a statistical basis, like Boltzmann did. Right, and that's the didn't mention earlier. That's the Boltzmann constant. Okay. So put that in easy speak. This is what the big boy physics books and textbooks have. You're supposed to know what that means now. It constitutes a single microstate. Okay. So 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 put that in regular English. Okay. The entropy of a pure perfect crystal at, at, at zero degrees Kelvin is zero. There we go. There we go. Perfect crystal, one microstate. Entropy is equal to zero. Okay, so hopefully that's clear and you understand that. Okay, now let's get into something really more practical, which is, okay, so that's your background material. And... Now, it's a matter of taking those, and those will help you rationalize these. And then a, a part of it's just going to be the monkey see, monkey do stuff. Okay, just working through the problems. Okay, which will still be a, a large majority of it. But again, it, without knowing this background, it's hard to sort slog through those problems to see what it's asking you. That's why, that's why these problems sometimes seem harder than they were before and in other classes. Because... Normally, especially when you get into second semester chemistry and second semester physics, the question you have to understand the context. If you get 2 plus 2 equals what, that's 4. There's no context for that. It gets harder when you say somebody has four apples and they, they eat one. How many do they have left? Well, they've got three. Now you have to put those numbers in context. So this is kind of a big boy version of, of that where we're at now. is It's hard to work these without understanding the concept behind it. Okay, so delta S and thermodynamic quantities. You have three thermodynamic quantities, right? Delta H, which you're familiar with, delta S, which you're familiar with now, and delta G is your third one. That's the total energy. When we talk about thermodynamic quantities, those are the big three that you're going to deal with. Yes, there are other thermodynamic quantities. We're only dealing with those because those are the ones that fall out of, a, of constant pressure conditions. Okay, so just like heat, the total uh, you can look at a reaction and just look at the products and the reactants. The total amount of entropy in any system for any reaction is going to be the sum of all of the entropy <coughs> that's contained in all of the products subtracted from the sum of all of the entropy and all of the reactants. It's that simple. It's that hilltop thing again. Yeah. So it's, right, so you've got something like this. So 
and there's the reactants and here's the products so what it's really telling you is if you start out with a certain entropy level here and this is delta s if the products if the entropy of all the products is greater than the entropy of all the reactants then it's going to be what positive and non-spontaneous so you can plug these numbers in and tell where on the other hand if the if the sum of all the entropies is less than all the reactants well guess what you've obviously had some structuring okay if it's less if that's less then you're going to go down and so you can you can look at the sign the travel that this goes so this is true for what delta s you can do these little energy diagrams for delta s and we've been doing them for delta h all along you can do them for delta now you can see that you can just visualize the same thing is true for delta s and you can also look at it for delta for energy as a whole so don't get confused these energy diagrams pop up all the time you need to look at the left axis and see what it is that it's talking about which one of these okay but those are the big three and you could talk about delta u which is internal energy and you could talk about other things too but we're going to limit it again we're going to limit it to these three okay pause while i wait on the wheel of death to go away Okay, last thermodynamic parameter, delta G. This is basically total energy. Okay, so let's go back to where you started. Internal energy is equal to heat energy plus work energy. When you do all of your, all of your calculations and you move this into constant pressure, here's what you're going to wind up with. Delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. Okay, I put this phrase up there. I put this U term up there because I want you to not panic and you to just see this is no big deal. It's exactly parallel. So I sometimes refer to this as the total energy. That's not true. It's actually the Gibbs energy, but it's a proxy for the total energy. Heat, we know. Enthalpy is heat at constant pressure. Okay, so I, I talk about delta H as being the heat term. And we have a work term. And there's where all the confusion comes from. This is your tripwire. This is going to be tough to get your head around, but we're going to have to. So your work term is buried in your entropy. Now this kind of sort of makes sense because what? As entropy increases, right, things are moving around faster and the balloon gets bigger. And so the balloon gets bigger, it pushes back on the atmosphere. And what does it do? It does work having to push. So... I look at heat, I look at enthalpy as being your heat term, and T delta S as being your work term. So this is what's confusing a little bit. Delta G is a form of energy. H is a form of energy. S is not a form of energy. It's only a form of energy when you combine it with T. Right? So remember, what, what remember our definition for uh, entropy? Oh, I'm gonna have to write that down now. Okay, so remember our definition for entropy was what? S is equal Q divided by T. Earlier, yes, delta S. Okay, well, duh. Well, let's rearrange this, and what do we get? Q is equal to T delta S. So you see where that comes in? So this is what? The total energy is equal to the Q that goes into to heating things up. And this is really Q that goes into what? Doing work. Got it? They're both Q. It's kind of weird. It's heat, but but it's, it's heat energy. Well, this is actually heat energy thermo. This is Q heat energy that what? Does it get turned into VRT? This gets turned into work. You've only got so much energy. You can do something. You can make the molecules go faster, or you can push back the, the environment. That's what you've got. And this is the tough part. Where you find out about the work is that's where the entropy comes in. Okay. 
So with that as a backdrop, let's look. And let's look at our energy diagram. So this is the second big deal to know if something is spontaneous in nature. We've got two things. Is something going to happen? You look at two things. What is delta S for the universe and what is delta G for the universe? Those will tell you what the story is. So if delta G is negative, that's spontaneous. Well, duh. If your reactants are up here and and your react your products if your reactants are over here and your products are over here if your products have less energy the sum total of energy in all of your products has less energy than sum of all of the molecules and atoms of your reactants then when you subtract the final minus the initial it's going to be a negative number or looking at it this way, delta G minus, to me, just visually, using pictures and not equations, using picture speak, I can see that delta G is downhill. And that's what the negative means to me. It's running downhill. And if water running downhill, it tells me it's spontaneous. That's kind of how we look at it. Okay, this is the big deal. Almost any, if you take a standardized chemistry test, they're going to ask you, is something spontaneous or not? And almost every time in a standardized test, you're going to do delta G, and you're just going to see if it's negative or not. If you can figure out how it's negative without doing a bunch of math, God bless you, you know the answer. But if you don't, if you can't look at the system and tell qualitatively, then you've got to ferret through the numbers and do it quantitatively. Okay, so we have a few situations here. So let's look down here. Now, delta G is a combination of two things. And one is positive and one is negative. Well, it's just great. Okay, so let's look at this. Now, by the way, what determines the sign of this? What determines the sign of this T delta S term is actually the sign of what? The sign of S. And this is the critical thing. Because here's what you need to realize. Really important. One of the most missed things in chemistry. Yep. Because it takes some thinking to work through this. And we don't like to do that. So what is the sign, which I'm going to call the work term. I'm going to call this whole thing, including the negative sign, the work term, right? So I like to think of this as delta H plus minus T delta S. Okay. That's just my head. That's easier for me. Why? Because this work term can be positive or negative. So let's look at that. What if delta S is positive? What's the work term? Positive times a negative is a negative. I know this is a negative. I'm just going to subtract that from it. But what if delta S is negative? What's a negative times a negative? A positive. And so I'm not going to add these two together. So the sign of delta S is really important. Really? Yeah. Yeah. The sign of delta S was really, really important because it would tell you whether something's going to freeze or not. That's pretty important stuff. Okay, so the sign, this sign is really, 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 really important. So let's look at it. And now you know why, now you know particularly why it's important. Because, because that is going to impact ultimately what the sign of delta G is. So let's look at the, so you've got four possible scenarios with delta G when you're combining these. This can be positive or negative, and, or this can be positive or negative. The work term can be positive or negative. Yes? So let's look at them. Let's zoom it up. Okay. I call these scenario one, two, three, four. Let's say that, you don't know this. Let's say delta S is minus. Let's say delta H is minus and delta S is positive. What do you know has to be true about delta G? It has to be negative. Why? Because if delta H is, and these are typical fair questions to give you a bunch of stuff that say, what's delta G going to be? Okay. So if delta G is minus, so maybe the best way to do this is now to put your T delta S term out here. Oh, that's a good way. Okay. So if delta S is positive, what is my T delta what is my minus T delta S term going to be? If this is positive and that's minus, it's going to be minus. 
Okay, now remember, to get my final answer, I'm adding these two. To get my final answer, I'm adding these two. I told you I like to think about adding this. Got it? So, so if you just get this, this becomes really, really easy. If this is minus and you add a minus number to a minus number, what are you going to get? It's impossible to get anything other than what? A minus number. So let me put this in word speak. If delta H is minus, and give me a word for that. I know, I know, I know. Everybody raises their hand, right? That's called exothermic. So here we go. So if a reaction is exothermic and it gains entropy, it has to be favorable. It has to be spontaneous. That's scenario one. In other words, if these two signs are opposite, that's got to be negative. Let's look at another scenario. Let's take a situation where delta H is positive. Oh, I know there's a word for that, endothermic. Yeah. And now you see where later on in chemistry too, all this stuff is supposed to start coming together because now you know what endo and exo means, right? All right. That's word speak and that's number speak. Okay, so if you have something that's endothermic, and by the way, a question may not tell you delta H is positive. It may just use the word endothermic. You're supposed, to, you're supposed to know that. You're supposed to know that's word speak, and if you need to turn that into math speak, that's what that means. So if delta H is positive, it's endothermic. And if delta S is minus, so if delta S is minus, what's my work term? It's going to be what? Positive. And if you add a positive number to a positive number, what must you get? A positive number. So here we go. And this makes sense. If you've got to add heat, and then, which is a bad thing, you got to do what? You got to add the heat, and and it, you add the heat, and the dang thing structures it. Delta S is minus. If you add heat and the thing goes structured, well, that ain't good. That's two things working against you. Okay. Now here's the next one. What if you have exothermic? That's favorable. That's favorable. But you have a positive of this. Now what's your what what's your term going to be here? If this is negative. And this is positive. This is going to be negative. Uh-oh. So now what do we have? We've got, uh, let's see, endothermic. We've got exothermic. Right. So we've got exothermic. That's a good thing. And then we've got an endothermic. Okay, so this is unfavorable. Yes, this is unfavorable. So we have something that's favorable. Let's see if I can draw this on here with a circle. So we have something that's favorable. And something that's unfavorable. So what's it going to be, positive or negative? I've got one thing pulling you uh, one direction and one thing pulling you another direction. So the answer is it could be either one of these. It depends on which is larger. Yes? And the same thing here. I have, this should have been the opposite. This actually should have been minus and positive. Oh, I cut and pasted that. Dang it, I did it wrong. Uh, okay, so let's clear that out. And let's look at this. All right, so now I'm going to have to change. I think I'm going to change this one to positive and this one to negative. Okay, technical glitch here. One typo messes it all up. Okay, let me blot that out. I'll make this one a positive and this one a minus. Because what I was actually explaining is this bottom scenario. Okay, so let's go back over here now. Okay, so exothermic, this is negative. If this is positive, what's my T delta S term going to be? T delta S. It's going to be negative. Okay, so what did I have here? Positive and negative. Um, something is... I really should not have done this. My four microstates are wrong. This can be positive, positive, or negative, negative. This can be positive, positive, or negative. Okay, here we go. So, if this is negative, what do I get here? If that's negative, a negative times negative is a positive. So, 
In one case, I've got things working against it. Let's see, and this can be negative. I'm going to have to cut this out of the tape. Y'all are going to have to go back and rewatch this. This is what a stinking typo, one typo does. Time stinking out. Nobody's typing anything over there. You guys should, okay. And now this is, now I've got the wheel of death. Okay. Let me show you what happened. I was pointing with nothing. See, I wrote the same thing again twice. So I'm trying to get, I'm trying to get back to, did I type it here? Uh, minus positive, no, minus positive, minus positive, plus minus. I need both of these. All right, man, that's a that's a bad typo there, isn't it? Okay, here's what we need at the bottom. Let me see if I can blot all of this out somehow. Oh, geez, maybe I can just make a new. I might have to go back to this one. This is the only one I have that's a little bit clean. Both of these should be the same sign, and both of these should be the same sign. Those are the four scenarios. Wow. Because what I kept doing was re-explaining the same thing where these have opposite signs. Okay, see that? This is negative, that's positive, that's positive, that's negative, this is negative, this is negative, that's positive, that's positive. Okay, so let's look at this third one. And let's look at the T delta S. Sorry about that. Now I got it wasted. 10 minutes over a typo. Okay, so the T delta S. So we've already done these two. So what's T delta S when this is negative? This is gonna be positive. Okay, well, negative is a good thing, that's spontaneous, but positive is a bad thing. So what's it gonna be, positive or negative, this one? What's it gonna be? Well, it depends on which one's bigger. So, right? If the entropy term, if the enthalpy term is bigger than the entropy term, then you're going to have, when you add these together, you're going to have a net number, and that's going to be spontaneous. On the other hand, if your entropy term is much bigger than the enthalpy term, then that's going to wind up giving you a positive number, and that's going to be unfavorable. See how simple it is once I get the table done. And the, okay, I'll just point with it. Likewise, if this is positive, if delta S is positive, what's your minus T delta S going to be? Negative. So what's your answer going to be? Well, if you had a positive and a negative, what's it going to be? I don't know. It could be either one. How so? Well, if your negative number is bigger than your positive number, it's going to be a net negative spontaneous. If your positive number is bigger than your negative number, that's going to be a net positive. Okay. So there's your four scenarios in unbutchered form. And this is kind of a diagram in your book that kind of shows you uh, how these play out, where you have delta H is less than zero or negative. So you can look at this diagram. And these over here are just where they're really, what they're really saying is, is it positive or negative? So in each of these lines, you have delta H as being positive or negative. And in each of these lines, you have delta S being positive or negative. And these four states are these four states. Okay. And you can see delta G is the sum over here. So, right. And that's the total energy. So what happens as you, so you can see as you increase temperature, you can kind of see what happens to these flip. As you increase, as you get really, really high, then you, you get into some things that were spontaneous now become non-spontaneous. And we probably know why that is, what the entropy. The entropy now at high temperature is moving so much that entropy term became really, really big and that put it over in the non-spontaneous area. And that's it for this section.